Good morning from the San Francisco Bay Area and good afternoon or good evening to you wherever you're joining us from. I'm Roland Green, the director of Stanford Humanities Center, and I want to welcome you to the launch of a new online series called Inside the Center. The series will feature the work of current and recent fellows at the Humanities Center. We intend to use it to direct a spotlight at some of the most provocative, unusual, and uh, groundbreaking work that is taking place under our roof. We'll talk about how exciting intellectual work is made in philosophy, history, music, art history, and all the disciplines of the humanities, and we'll give special attention to work in progress or recently completed. If you are among the general public, we welcome you warmly to our community and hope you will want to join us here from time to time. And if you're a former fellow, a Stanford alum, or a member of our humanities community, welcome back to the Stanford Humanities Center. We think you will want to be here again. This is our 40th anniversary year. And as we take stock of our history over that period, we're also exploring new ways of bringing our research to an enlarged audience. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website. So please feel free to invite others to join us in their own time. I also want to mention because the webinar format can feel to the audience like one is the only person watching that you are part of a large live audience for those of you who have been to our building which you see behind me on the stanford campus and remember our large lecture hall today's audience is a standing room only crowd in that room our speaker today is ramsey fawaz who will discuss his current research on how armistead mopin's serial fiction tales of the city was encountered by its original readers in the San Francisco Chronicle between 1976 and 1983, and how Tales of the City spoke to the values of the gay liberation movement in those years. He'll speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll entertain questions uh, for the rest of our time together until about 1230. Professor Fawaz, and I, I have to really call him Ramsey, uh, was a fellow at the Humanities Center this past year in the group that we will always remember for having their year interrupted by the COVID crisis. And what a powerful and connective fellow he was. Ramsey is interested in everything. He is responsive to approaches very different from his own. And he is, as every fellow who was uh, there this year would, would agree with me, he is intellectually alive in ways that model the life of the scholar for all of us. He is the author of The New Mutants, Superheroes and the Radical Imagination of American Comics, New York University Press 2016, a book that won prizes as the best first book from the Center for LGBTQ Studies at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and the best book overall from the Association for the Study of the Present, ASAP. If you grew up reading about Superman or the Fantastic Four, or if you're just curious about how comics have shaped our imaginations, The New Mutants is a must read. Probably the only, uh, probably the best book of literary criticism about superheroes yet written, and a book that shows better than anything else that I've ever read how literary analysis lends insight to the most familiar, popular, or everyday materials. Ramsey was co editor of a special issue award-winning special issue of the journal american literature titled queer about comics which appeared two years ago and he is a co-editor of a forthcoming book keywords for comics which uh, will appear later this year his new book queer forms also to be published by nyu press explores the influence that movements for women's and gay liberation had on american popular culture in the 1970s and after Ramsey Fawaz is Associate Professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Now, just before we begin, if you want to submit a question during the webinar, click the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your Zoom screen to type in your question. We will try to get to all of the questions after the talk, but if we don't manage to do so, then we will try to answer them post-event. Ramsey, we are so pleased that you're finishing up your year with us by serving as the first speaker in our new series, Inside the Center. Please go ahead and get us started. Great. 
Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? If you give me just one second, we're just working on making the video appear. Okay, how's that? Hi, everybody. Good morning. It's so great to be here. Uh, I want to thank you so much for this wonderful introduction, Roland, and for the opportunity to share my work. And I want to thank everybody in the middle of this very turbulent time for taking a moment to come and hang out with me and talk with me about my research. So um, the, finally, I also want to thank all of the staff at the Stanford Humanities Center who've uh, made this possible. Uh, so I want to give you guys an hour and a half of a break in the clouds. Uh, of everything that's going on in our lives. And I wanna take you through a tour of kind of queer San Francisco. So what I'm gonna start by doing is I'm gonna spend a little bit of time sharing with you a little bit about my new book, the, the kind of overall project. And then I'm gonna do a very sustained case study of Tales of the City in the 1970s. It might seem at first that Tales has nothing to do with the world that we're living in at this moment, this kind of fun, playful, queer narrative. But I'm gonna show you some of the ways in which 1970s popular culture kind of has everything to do with the moment we're living in because so much of the popular culture of that moment was trying to circulate radical political ideas to broad audiences so um i'll be happy to take questions about the whole project or tales of the city afterwards and i'm thrilled to share some of this research with you all all right so now i'm going to share my screen and here we go I give you Queer Love on Barbary Lane, the sexual politics of serial gay fiction in Armistead Maupin's Tales of the City. On Monday, May 24th, 1976, the San Francisco Chronicle published the first installment of Armistead Maupin's serialized gay fiction, Tales of the City, a daily soap opera narrating the social and sexual misadventures of a group of queer San Francisco neighbors living on Russian Hill. Ooh, one moment, there we go. The opener drew readers in with the titillating headline, she's single, she's 25, single and mad for SF. Readers who chose to follow the siren call would meet Marianne Singleton, a straight-laced, independent-seeking Clevelander dead set on making a move to the city by the bay. Tales hooked its audience with a title that reads like a personals ad, admitting a very queer sort of desire. A young woman, single, rashly in love with a city, but perhaps also with an unknown person whose initials, SF, could indicate a lover of any gender, any race, any sexuality. The narrator tells us, Marianne Singleton was 25 years old when she saw San Francisco for the first time. On the fifth night, she drank three Irish coffees at the Buena Vista, realized that her mood ring was blue, and decided to phone her mother in Cleveland. And here we see Laura Linney in her famous role in the 1993 adaptation. And I'll use images here and there from the adaptation just to give this a little visual life. It continues, Mom, I called to tell you something. I'm not coming home. When it was over, Marianne walked through Aquatic Park to the bay, drunk with the prospect of an undefined future. Nearly a year later, following a series of disastrous affairs, joining a chosen family among her neighbors at 28 Barbary Lane, surviving a deranged serial killer, and gaining the motherly mentorship of her transsexual landlady, Anna Madrigal, Marianne would turn to her gay best friend, Michael Tolliver, and say, Michael, I feel that I'm on the verge of something really wonderful. I'm changing a lot, aren't I? He nodded, smiling. It's called coming out. To which she replies, a girl can come out. I mean, if she's straight and all. Uh-huh, straight and all. Of course, Marianne had already come out hundreds of serial installments before when she called her mother, like so many queer people, in a classic scene of frightened disclosure unsure of what consequences might unfold from her declaration that she loved the wrong object, not heterosexuality, not Cleveland, but SF. From its first installment, Tales of the City was a coming out story that instilled in its readers, straight and all, the affective feeling of an undefined queer future 
that might unfold from a sudden reorientation of anyone's desire to a city like San Francisco and its queer cultural values in the radical 1970s. In the language of 1970s gay liberation, coming out of the closet was a declaration of a personal truth about one's sexual orientation that required repeated performances over time. You never come out once, right? You come out over and over and over again to various people. In its movement back and forth between immediate daily installments and longer unfolding storylines, Tales of the City's serial narrative provided a creative form for exploring this double movement of coming out as both declaration and duration. That is, as something one expresses in a single statement, I'm gay, I'm trans, I'm X, right? But then must live out repeatedly in sexual and social acts across time. Reading each installment publicly on trains, buses, and sidewalks, individual readers of all sexualities admitted their investment in queer social bonds to others. And through repeated reading, they inhabited that investment as a way of life. So one of the original readers of Tales of the City that I interviewed for this project said something quite amazing to me, which is that he would take the California one bus that would kind of drive all the way through the city to downtown every day. And people would read Tales of the City directly in front of each other. And it was one way that they came out to each other was to kind of wink and say like, I'm reading this queer narrative on this bus and I know you are too. In the mid 1970s, Tales of the City was one of many cultural forms that gave shape to the emergent political values of movements for women's and gay liberation. Starting in the late 60s, these social movements developed concepts for describing and doing justice to alternative expressions of gender and sexuality, while spearheading a cultural revolution to disseminate or circulate more open-ended understandings of these categories. Essentially, these movements wanted to teach Americans to think differently about sex and gender. In my new book, Queer Forms, I explore how the central concepts of movements for women's and gay liberation, including gender equality, consciousness raising, lesbian separatism, and coming out of the closet, among others, were translated into concrete cultural or aesthetic forms that gave specificity to and diversified the range of possible genders and sexualities that could be imagined in the mind's eye. I define form broadly as the variety of aesthetic figures, structures, or tropes that give material shape to abstract ideals, desires, and experiences. So my understanding of form is very broad. It's, it's, it's an idea of giving shape to something so that it can be imagined in the mind's eye. Perhaps counterintuitively, I argue that cultural objects, that cultural projects to represent non-normative or queer genders and sexuality often appeared in the most traditional and sometimes conservative forms, including the sequential format of comic strip serials, the token figures of science fiction genre, the narrative conventions of film melodrama, and the serial rhythm of installment fiction. So I'll give you a couple of examples. In my second chapter, for instance, I show how experimental science fiction films like Zardoz and Born in Flames gave shape to the concept of separatism, the lesbian feminist ideal of complete divestment, cutting ties with male society. And they, they did so by, by showing utopian communes or underground cells where gender and sexual outlaws create society separate from the dominant culture. And if you have not seen Zardoz, it's bonkers, it'll blow your mind, go watch it tonight. And in chapter three, I explore how the 1970 gay film drama, The Boys in the Band, visually depicted the concept of feminist consciousness raising in the form of a gay male friendship circle whose members contentiously argue and dialogue about their experiences of homophobia. So the project ranges over a, a very big eclectic group of cultural texts I do a chapter about um, feminist and lesbian science fiction and fantasy. I look at things like The Stepford Wives, Joanna Russ's The Female Man, and Maxine Hong Kingston's The Woman Warrior. And later in the book, I look at texts 
kind of entering the AIDS era, and I do a chapter on angels in America. In my book, I developed the concept of queer formalism to describe, on the one hand, the tactics and strategies that artists, writers, and filmmakers deployed to represent gender and sexual nonconformity in different mediums, and on the other, as a method of interpretation that treats forms as enabling structures or shapes that powerfully articulate alternative genders and sexualities. So think of it this way, we live in a world in which gender and sexual fluidity is now more and more celebrated in queer and feminist activism and theory. And so forms, shapes, are often kind of seen in a suspicious light as something that constrains people or locks them in. And I wanna think about forms as actually much more playful, labile ways in which we translate our experience of gender and sexuality to others. In his recent book, Abstract Bodies, 60s Sculpture in the Expanded Field of Gender, art historian David Getze innovates the concept of transgender capacity, which he defines as the ability or the potential for making visible or knowing genders as mutable, successive, and multiple. He continues, it can be located or discerned in texts, objects, and cultural forms that support an interpretation or recognition of proliferative modes of gender nonconformity, unquote. By thinking of gender transitivity, not only as an identity or a lived experience owned by individual people, but also as a formal capacity or ability of artistic production, Getsy opens up the possibility of seeing queer genders and sexualities as present in everything from artistic mediums to storytelling conventions and art practices. This is an amazing idea of thinking about transitivity or transness as everywhere. Queer formalism then allows us to identify and make sense of those moments when queer genders and sexualities, far from being repressed, oppressed, or negated, are, be, are made visible in legible but complex ways that remain accessible to a wide range of potential viewers. So another way to put this is one of the major driving forces for this project is my sense that we've now come to a point where we have an incredibly rich vocabulary for describing all of the ways in which our society oppresses, makes invisible, destroys, and violates minoritized people. We have terms like appropriation, cultural theft, violation, harm, et cetera, oppression. What we don't have is as much of a rich vocabulary to describe the ethical ways in which people actually come to understand one another across differences. We don't have as strong of a vocabulary of describing, for instance, how people become not homophobic or not racist. And if we didn't believe that people could change, then what would be the point of social, social um, movements, right? So part of what my project does is it investigates cultural forms that try to work on people's homophobia, to work on people's sexism and transform that. Despite the many and well-documented differences between women's and gay liberation, these movements both shared a utopian goal of opening up the possibilities of what women and LGBT people could desire from their genders, their sex lives, their emotional bonds, and their society. So throughout this talk, I'm gonna use the terms queer and queerness to describe both movements' expanded range of desires for different kinds of gender and sexual expressions. I argue, ultimately, that the broader legacy of women's and gay liberation lies not in any single figure they produced or any single political tactic or strategy, but in their continual incitement to practices of shaping or giving form to queer genders and sexualities. So I'm essentially doing a history of queer and feminist imagination in the 70s. So this talk comes from my fourth chapter, which explores how serial narrative, fictional storytelling, presented to readers in installments over time, functioned as a powerful form for circulating diverse um, expressions of gay identity and new kinds of queer social bonds to public audiences. I take as my case study 
the most popular 1970s serial gay fiction, Armistead Maupin's Tales of the City, which first appeared in daily installments in the San Francisco Chronicle between 1976 and 1977. I begin by unpacking how 1970s gay liberation framed coming out of the closet as a revolutionary strategy for proliferating queerness throughout the social body. I then show how tales harnessed the emotional power of this kind of revelation by making coming out a normal everyday practice that could be taken up by anyone, even straight cisgender people, as a way of forging unexpected bonds across difference. So one thing I wanna point out before I get into that is that um, over two summers, I interviewed 28 people who had read Tales of the City in the San Francisco Chronicle in the 70s. And it was an extraordinary experience to kind of draw upon their life experiences reading the text in my analysis. So throughout, I'm gonna quote different people and I'm happy to talk more about that in Q&A. In the larger chapter, I do a very long analysis of the characters. I talk about race um, uh, in, in Tales of the City. And I think a lot about the way it looked in the newspaper. But today I'll focus on coming out of the closet as a central idea in the story. Three weeks into Tales of the City's first year of publication, Mona Ramsey, long-term tenant at 28 Barbary Lane, the quote, ramshackle two-story structure made of brown shingles that houses our cast, checks in with her beloved friend and landlady, Anna Madrigal, about the new renter, Mary Ann. Mona asks, did you get a chance to talk to her privately? Madrigal replies, just for a few minutes, in my bedroom. She saw the picture on my dresser. She thought it was Mr. Madrigal. My husband, that is. Bizarre, Mona exclaims. Well, it's a logical conclusion, Mona, Madrigal retorts. The poor thing's from Cleveland, for heaven's sake. She's not prepared for those kinds of possibilities. To any seasoned reader of Tales of the City, those kinds of possibilities include the fabulous revelation made public months later that Madrigal is a transsexual, and I'm using the terminology that was used in the 70s, of course, that she served as a military officer in World War II and had, quote, a sex change operation in Denmark before moving to San Francisco to start a new life. Tales of the City's main cultural work in the mid-1970s was to transform its readers to be the kinds of people who would be prepared for and even desiring of the queer possibilities that Madrigal secret embodies. It was not merely that Tales introduced its audience to a range of queer characters, from gay men to transsexual women to queer questioning and closeted folks of different genders, but that its serial narrative predicated on the ceaseless production of mystery and revelation instilled its readers with the affective orientation toward positively receiving the queerness of others. In this sense, Tales of the City gave both formal shape and affective or emotional force to the gay liberationist value of coming out of the closet. And here we see um, the, the, the uh, cover of the first um, Gay Liberation Front newsletter in 1970. And here we see Harvey Milk at one of the San Francisco um, uh, Gay Liberation Parades. In the early 1970s, coming out emerged as one of the most radical and socially effective strategies for politicizing gay identity. As one gay liberation activist stated in 1971, quote, gay people, when they first realize that they're gay, have a process of coming out sexually. We've extended that to the political field. We feel that we have to come out politically as a community, which is aware that it is oppressed and which is a political power block, unquote. In this view, coming out is understood first as a process of coming into one's own erotic freedom through a series of social acts, but that ultimately bind people together who claim a shared identity through a public admission of their gayness, thereby making them a significant political force. Coming out then was not only a practice of self-disclosure, but more radically a theory of what Valerie Rohe has called queer reproduction. Coming out was a way to materially spread difference from heterosexuality through the indefinitely repeated and collectively shared experience 
of living and desiring at a slant from heterosexual life trajectories. So I really want to impress upon everybody that coming out in the 70s was not at all what we think of it today. We think of it today, right? The image we have in our mind is some young person looking at their parents and saying, I'm gay and worried that they're going to be disowned. But this, this scene of self-disclosure was understood in a much more radical, expansive way in the early 70s. It was almost anarchic because the idea was that when you declared that you were gay, you would send a shockwave through the people around you. It could transform the world in unpredictable ways. So when you come out, what could happen? Somebody could inflict violence upon you. And if that happened, people might band together to protect you. Somebody might be inspired to also come out. And then you're literally making more gay people. So in a sense, it, coming out was about saying, in fact, we do have an agenda. We do want to make more gay people. And that's what we're going to do, right? And so Harvey Milk's conception of coming out, for instance, in, this, in the mid-70s, was about the idea that if you did that, if you came out to people, they couldn't try to hurt you politically because you were then human to them and they could see you. And so he saw coming out as transforming liberal political relationships. Tales of the City modeled what the politics of gay liberation might look like when coming out of the closet was translated from a revolutionary political statement to an everyday interpersonal form for forging relations of deep intimacy outside the heterosexual family. This sexual politics reframed the emotional or felt relationship of readers towards queerness in two ways. It made the encounter with non-normative gender and sexualities and alternative sex cultures not only mysterious and exciting, but pleasurable and desirable. You wanted to be part of queer life when you read Tales of the City. And it hailed its reading audience as a distinctly queer public. So Tales of the City sexual politics took shape in three conceptual moves. And the rest of my talk is just gonna be unpacking these three moves. First, Tales of the City understood coming out as a broadly accessible practice available to people who appeared far outside the boundaries of gay and lesbian identity. At various points in the narrative, Mona Ramsey, the latter-day hippie and longtime friend of Michael Tolliver, comes out as a, quote, fag hag and a failed lesbian. I'm showing you the characters as they appeared in the 1993 um, adaptation. Anna Madrigal confesses to her lover, Edgar Halcyon, that she grew up in a whorehouse in Winnemucca, Nevada, and later explains to her beloved tenant, Mona, that she is in fact her father. And Dee Dee Halcyon Day, the unhappily married daughter of the aristocratic Halcyon family, increasingly comes out as a, quote, liberated woman, first as the mother of interracial children born out of wedlock, and later as, as bisexual. I think it's, this is an amazing moment, for instance, in which one of the stories that focuses on Dee Dee appeared in the paper alongside a story about a Republican sergeant coming out of the closet. And so in some sense, the story was replicating forms of liberation and coming out in real life. And the two were playing off of each other visually on the newspaper page. In this way, um, oh, coming out also takes many rhetorical forms throughout Tales of the City. Characters come out to one another through everyday conversations related to the readers as personal dialogue. They write letters about being gay. The narrative's omniscient voice sometimes tells us their secrets, or there are unexpected revelations of one sort of queerness or another. In this way, Tales of the City articulated the lived practice of coming out to the central formal or rhetorical conceit of installment or serial fiction, the idea of the cliffhanger. Serial narrative requires the continual production of mystery followed by spectacular revelation, which in turn spins out more mystery, right? It's soap opera in nature, so you wanna keep coming back for more. In Tales of the City, the characters' various revelations about themselves become both an occasion for the unfolding movement of plots, as well as a deeply satisfying affective experience of being attuned toward various forms of surprise. So this is beautifully captured in the ridiculous and fun titles of many of the individual installments, right? 
the landlady gets more mysterious. The truth about Anna Madrigal, the landlady confesses Francis's discovery. Beecham confesses to Dee Dee, and it continues, right? It's people sharing awful secrets, people being revealed. Um, and another great example of this is the idea that at the end of one story, at the beginning, there's this question, who is Mrs. Madrigal anyway? And the story is telling us, oh, I'm going to tell you a little bit, a little bit more next time. More importantly, the text distinguishes between playful, benign admissions and those kinds of dis disclosures that require the building of trust. When Madrigal first invites Marianne to her apartment for dinner three weeks into the series, she carefully considers whether or not to share the truth of her identity, that she is transsexual. And by extension, she's considering whether to share that with us, the readers. Looking at a photo of a young man in military uniform perched on Madrigal's dresser, Marianne asks her, is that Mr. Madrigal? The question came out sounding harsh. Marianne's face turned crimson. Mrs. Madrigal looked at the secretary for a moment, apparently weighing a decision of some sort. No, dear, you're a lovely child. We just have to have a little chat, that's all. There was no Mr. Madrigal, or Mrs. Madrigal for that matter. Marianne says, I'm afraid I don't understand. And Madrigal responds, I made it up. Isn't it l a lovely name? In this moment, the narrative voice gives us insight into both characters' positions. We are at once privy to Marianne's indiscretion in approaching other people's private lives. She blushes at her own harsh delivery, but we're also aware of Madrigal's smart calculation about Marianne's capacity to handle some unknown truth. What we will later find out is Madrigal's transsexualities. So readers are being given a, a, a vision of the kind of psychological calculations that queer people have to make when they decide that they are gonna come out to somebody. But at the same time, we are seeing the fact that queer people also invent themselves or make themselves. So when Madrigal says, isn't it a lovely name, I made it up? She's celebrating the idea, this experience that transgender people ex have of being able to self-nominate, to name themselves and invent themselves anew. So we get both sides of that. Rather than attempt to teach us a lesson in tolerance or berate us for our retrograde attitudes, Maupin here transforms the revelation of potential queerness into the very mysteries of the story's plotline. You become more queer and more aware of queerness just by reading onward, so that we both desire to know, but also desire to be the kind of person who deserves to know these things. Because Tales of the City was read communally, both broadly among Bay Area residents, but also intimately shared among family members, roommates, and coworkers. The story circulated the seemingly private experience of surprise across its reading audience. Living in a communal house of gay artists, former dancer Michael Bluegrass describes, quote, at first we couldn't believe that something that gay was actually going to be published in the Chronicle. Somebody would go get the paper and they'd bring it back and everybody would pass it around and read it. And commenting on the political nature of Tales' publicness, journalist Randy Alfred stated to me, I mean, the thing that makes it different was this communal event. It was a shared thing. And telling people that straight people can talk in public about getting laid, well, then gay people can too. So it's political in the way the word political is used in feminist discourse. Perhaps most revealing is Tanya Schulberg's recounting of the way that Tales was, quote, a mechanism for conversations that allowed me to express my values and to talk to my parents about it. An Oakland resident teacher and civil rights activist in the 70s, um, Schulberg explained the effects of reading and discussing the serial daily with her parents. So they would read it every day. She would call them on the phone. They lived a little bit down south in the Bay Area, and they would talk. And she says, it was very interesting because I think my father was pretty homophobic at the time, but he read the column and we would talk about it. And I think it changed his outlook. And her mom would ask her all these questions about, about being transgender, about characters being transgender, and she would explain. So this to me is totally extraordinary, right? Because in the study of literature, we often really struggle to be able to explain the actual material influence that a work of literature has on people. 
We can't just say, oh, because people read African American novels, they become not racist, right? It's not that simple. It's not a causal relationship. What we see here is an amazing moment in which the conditions under which people read Tales of the City, where a gay person was essentially live tweeting queer people's everyday experience in the Bay Area to more than 500,000 um, people who would receive um, the paper, created the conditions in which people could actually talk about the reading experience. Schulberg describes one of the ways that literary production can have a materially transformative effect on readers' affective or felt sense of the world. And in this case, tales made queerness a regular object of collective concern that elicits multiple conversations, dialogue, that work on people's worldviews over time through repeated exposure to queer intimacy, sexuality, and desire. Second, Tales of the City is a font of queer knowledge offering both a primer on LGBT life, as well as, an expansive uh, as well as the expansive heterosexual sex cultures of 1970s San Francisco. In case you hadn't known that co-ed bathhouses were offering the world's cleanest orgy, you would be informed on day two of reading tales when the sexually liberated flight attendant Connie Bradshaw hands Marianne um, a, new, a magazine detailing the rise of straight swinging spaces. And this character is brilliantly played um, by Parker Posey. We soon learn about the social Safeway, pictured here, the famous Marina Safeway in San Francisco, a quote, local tradition every Wednesday night, where gay and straight singles cruise for sex and dates. We learn about the mixed crowd of the stud bar, pictured here in its original version, one of the only locales where a gay man and his straight male friend can both score on the, on the same night. The Come Clean Center, a laundromat fit for, more for picking up casual sex than cleaning your underwear, and Tuesday nights at a South San Francisco roller skating rink. Tuesday night is gay night, Michael explains to Mona in one story. It's the damnedest thing you've ever seen. 200 dudes on roller skates, a regular Sodom and Gomorrah on wheels. This knowledge had material effects as it not only outed particular subcultures of gay and straight San Francisco to mass reading audiences, but also potentially recruited curious readers into the city's growing social and sexual cultures. Almost everyone I talked to said, I used it as a way to find out places I should go in the city that I hadn't been before. Recalling her fortuitous discovery of tales around the time of her arrival to San Francisco in the late 70s, Graphic artist Beth Grace Silver gushed to me, quote, at the age of 25, I moved from Detroit to San Francisco to start my new life. I had no friends and I had never met a gay person. All that changed quickly. I remember reading my first Tales column. I used it as my personal guide to how to be single person in San Francisco. Marina Safeway, went there. Buena Vista, done. I learned to drink coffee. Tales has been a blueprint for me, unquote. Consequently, Maupin altered the traditional understanding of a queer subject position of one of immaturity, deviance, or perversion into a desired position of canny knowing. So being queer in his worldview is to know and is to get other people to want to know what you know, right? So I wanna give you a picture of what this looked like in the paper. The um, tales often appeared in a section of the paper that was next to um, like what are thought of as feminine or women's um, kind of issues, right? So um, the idea of uh, lifestyle activities, sewing, shopping, cooking, cleaning advice. Some people might say that because it was placed in that way, it was made to seem frivolous. But I actually want to say that by doing so, it made it part of people's everyday lives. Reading Tales of the City was as everyday as stretching, doing um, exercise, sewing, buying groceries. I also want to point out that throughout the 1976-77 period, the Chronicle became exceptionally gay as a newspaper. It became obsessed with telling stories about gay social life, gay fashion. So we see three different uh, images of, th they write extensively about transsexual experiences, about gay politics. And in fact, one reader writes in in late 77 and says, you know, I'm not against gay people, but I kind of feel like this newspaper has basically become a gay newspaper. And that's confusing to me. 
So in some sense, Tales of the City was part of encouraging the Chronicle to become a space for circulating queer knowledge. And so even though it was a fiction appearing in a newspaper, it came to have the feeling of truth because it was speaking about people's everyday lives. Finally, and most subversively, Tales of the City offered a public model for the reproduction of queerness without making any recourse to the origins of homosexuality. I think this is quite amazing. In more than 280 entries between 1976 and 77, Tales never once attempted to decide or even address the question of whether homosexuality is genetically inherited or culturally conditioned. Maupin did not care about the nature and nurture debate. The idea that homosexuality unfolds then is built into the very form of Tales' narrative. And it is materialized not in proof of genetic gayness or even belonging to a distinctly queer subculture, whether it was leather queens, clones, dykes, etc., but merely in the event of being hailed as potentially one of us. So essentially, queerness entails is simply what anyone else sees in you. This is impressed upon readers within the series' first week of publication. When Marianne first arrives at 28 Barbary Lane, Mrs. Madrigal asks her, do you want the place? The narrative continues. Marianne, um, Marianne heard herself saying yes. I knew you were one of us from the minute you walked in, uh, Madrigal says to her. Marianne studied the woman's face for a moment and came to the conclusion that it was quite beautiful. There was something puzzling though, some ill-concealed secret that surfaced on Mrs. Madrigal's face. I'm bl glad to be here, Marianne said at last. Of course you are, said the landlady. Here, Marianne appears to think she has spotted something queer about Madrigal, a quote, ill-concealed secret that might be divined in her face. This is, of course, the classic transphobic idea that one can identify if someone is a real or authentic man or woman on their basis of their facial features. But Marianne is taken by surprise that it is Madrigal who sees her own ill-concealed secret, that Marianne is ultimately a queer in the making. And in, and in a sense, this is the relationship that Tales of the City had to its audience which is that Maupin is always hailing or calling upon his readers as queer. So if you were straight identified and you were reading it and always saying, oh, but I'm straight, the, 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 the story is always like, no, but you're not. Like, nobody is. By the way, like, you're not, you're not. Perhaps no moment in the text more brilliantly captures Tales of the City's will to queer reproduction than its most classic expression of coming out, Michael's widely cited letter to his mother, in which Michael finally tells his conservative Floridian family that he's gay. And I'm gonna read this at length. No mama, I wasn't recruited. No seasoned homosexual ever served as my mentor. But you know what? I wish someone had. I wish someone older than me and wiser than the people in Tallahassee had taken me aside and said, you're all right, kid. You can grow up to be a doctor or a teacher just like anyone else. You're not crazy or sick or evil. You can succeed and be happy and find peace with all kinds of friends. Most of all, you can love and be loved without hating yourself for it. But no one ever said that to me. Mama, I had to find it out on my own with the help of this beautiful city that has become my home. San Francisco is full of men and women, both straight and gay, who ignore sexuality in considering the worth of another human. Being gay has taught me tolerance, compassion, and humility. It has given me people whose passion and kindness have provided a constant source of strength. It has brought me into the family of ma man, mama, and I like it here. I like it. The force of Michael's letter to mama is twofold. Rather than defending against the myth of homosexual recruitment, Michael stresses the value of more experienced queer people mentoring young queers, particularly in his wish that a seasoned homosexual had served as his mentor. He says, we should recruit. The analogy to this mentorship is Tales of the City itself, which hailed its seasoned readers, regardless of their stated sexual identity, as those recruiters of future generations of queers, even providing them a script 
for articulating love and support for the flourishing of queer life. So I can't tell you how many people I interviewed who said that when they sent this letter to people around the country that they knew, people began to use the words that Michael uses to, to, to give support to people who came out to them. So in a sense, the letter provides a blueprint for what it would look like to do this. Second, in his letter, Michael frames homosexuality not as an identity, but as a set of values that fuels the production of new social relationships among members of the family of man. Gayness, Michael explains, is the basis for friendship. And far from being reviled or detested, it is to be liked. This is honestly one of the most powerful cultural expressions of the gay liberationist view that gay is good that Tales of the City offered to its readers in the 1970s. And it calls upon those readers as people with the power to make more gay people exist and exist happily in the world. And I think that's actually quite astonishing. So moving towards a conclusion, that project of making more people exist, gay people exist or recruiting people into queerness is captured in Tales of the City's most powerful moment of myth-making, when Anna Madrigal re-narrates the history of San Francisco as one of queer migrants reunited in the city by the bay. Laying in bed with her lover, Edgar Halcyon, Anna expounds, there's a theory that we are all Atlanteans, us, San Franciscans. Edgar grinned at her indulgently, bracing himself for another of her yarns. Do you want to hear it or are you getting stuffy on me? Never. Tell me a story. Well, in one of our last incarnations, we were all citizens of Atlantis. All of us. You, me, Franny, Dee Dee, Marianne. We all lived in this lovely enlightened kingdom that sank beneath the sea a long time ago. Now we've come back to this special peninsula at the edge of the continent because we know in a secret corner of our minds that we must return together to the sea. Here's the strange part. Do you know what dominated the skyline of Atlantis? A huge pyramid. In her tall tale, Madrigal upsets all San Francisco origin stories based in colonial histories of Western expansion and the white moneyed classes. She addresses all the city's citizens, a collective us from its most established rich elites to its most rebellious queer transplants as people who always belonged here and have simply returned home. It is telling that Madrigal relates the story to Edgar Halcyon, arguably the most straight figure in all of Tales of the City, a rich white cisgender heterosexual married patriarch. Edgar potentially represents the quote stuffiest reader of Tales of the City. But the intimacy of this scene in which this very kind of reader is quite literally in bed with a trans woman destabilizes this subject position. For all it takes for Edgar to become queer in this moment is for him to be hailed by Madrigal as one of us. And repeatedly called upon as a queer member of Anna's family, Edgar at one point cannot deny, and he says that for reasons he couldn't explain to the world, Anna Madrigal was becoming very important to him. And so too, for all those former Atlanteans returning home, San Francisco had become very important to them. In Madrigal's deft hands, queerness, that radical force that will shape the foundations of San Francisco like an earthquake, becomes its own origin story, requiring no explanation or cause aside from its mere existence and its glorious capacity to forge bonds of love and intimacy among people, straight and all, wherever they are from. In so doing, Madrigal offered her own tale of the city, one that aligns with the radical claims of gay liberation, namely that, quote, gay revolution will produce a world in which all social and sensual relationships will be gay and which, which homo and heterosexuality will become incomprehensible terms. Thank you, Ramsey. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think all of us who experienced your work over the past year would say that that was a talk that was really um, representative of the way you think. It was granular and theoretical at the same time and omnivorous as usual. So thank, thank you, you so much. That was so Absolutely. rich. Absolutely.
My pleasure. We're gonna, we're gonna do some questions now. And uh, the way we're gonna do this is that I will uh, give you, the, I will pass on the questions that come uh, through the Q&A function on, on Zoom. Uh, and uh, I'd like to start, so anybody in the audience that wants to submit a question, please do. And I will, we will try to get to them all. Uh, I want to start by asking you something about the process that goes into this kind of project. So what I would say is how, what was the process by which you interviewed the original readers of Tales of the City? And, and what do you think this kind of evidence does for the way that we can study literature in the in yeah. today's political environment? This is a great question. Um, I really wanted to push myself to be methodologically um, out of the box for this project, to do something I'd never done. So in my previous work, I'm kind of famous for doing very, 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 um, um, oh, one second, I need to unshare my screen. So um, let me do that, stop sharing. Okay, how is that? Um, so I really wanted to be out of the box because I wanted to be able to explain a little bit more about how certain texts have an effective influence on people's lives. I didn't wanna just be able to close read or analyze the content of a text. I wanted to have a better understanding of how it transmits new ways of feeling to people. Um, and so the way I started doing this was that I actually just put ads in the paper. I was really inspired by a famous um, gay film theorist people might know named Richard Dyer, brilliant, who wrote an essay I'm obsessed with called um, Judy Garland and Gay Men in the 1980s. And one of the methods that he took in that essay was that he put all these ads in different uh, British newspapers asking gay people to write him about why they love Judy Garland so that he could analyze their affective attachment to her. So I followed that, um, uh, a well-known columnist at the, uh, the Chronicle put an ad in the paper for me and I got like 50 responses by email. And you know, doing interviews is a long intensive process. It took me two summers. I would sometimes go to meet someone for 20 minutes. We would talk for two and a half hours. I would sometimes have repeat visits. I had to transcribe all the interviews. What was so beautiful about the outcome though, was a few things. One, I had a much stronger sense of the way in which people interacted with a text in its everyday form. We're all used to the book adaptations of Tales of the City. But so this allowed me to see how people received it in the paper, how it related to their everyday life. And the key thing that relates to today's contemporary moment, when we think about how to study literature and its political valence today, is that we have to know the context in which people read and make meaning out of something. So it became very clear to me that the way people read Tales of the City um, involved that they were constantly talking to other people about it. Mm -hmm. They didn't just read it and then put it away. They were in dialogue with others. And that's a central part of how literature does politics, is the public articulation of the meaning making people attach to um, that practice. Um, and I also just learned so much about 1970s San Francisco history. I'll, I'll give one more thing before we go to another question. Um, there was one person that I spoke to who was just, who was at Berkeley when she was reading Tales of the City. And she said something really meaningful to me. She said, you have to understand what it felt like to have lived in a moment where we impeached Nixon. We elected Harvey Milk. We thought the sky was the limit and anything was possible. And she said, Tales of the City was part of this kind of utopian promise of progressive transformation in, in this country. And she said the downfall of that, the Reaganism, AIDS, and later Trump, she's like, was so devastating, it's, it cannot be put into words. So she's like, you have to understand that the text circulated at a moment of possibility. And that was very powerful to me. And I don't think you could know that just by reading um, it in the paper. Oh, and I will say one more thing. Sorry, one more thing. Sure. Nobody has ever actually studied or published about Tales of the City as it appeared in the Chronicle. There is only one published academic mm. article on it uh, by a narratologist who's brilliant, but who only studies the novels. And it's a very different reading experience in the paper, which I can talk about in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I want to ask a quick follow-up about that, about the, about the interviews. Did you... Um, 
you know, most of us who work on literary works uh, don't have the uh, luxury of interviewing, like in the case of a serial work, you know, imagine, yeah. how, imagine how much a scholar of Dickens would love to be able to go back yeah. and, and interview the people that read, uh, you know, Bleak House in serial form, you know? Yeah. Uh, you have that luxury because of the particular uh, contours of your project. Were there ways in which the uh, insights you got from the interviews help to change your conceptualization of the larger project? Yes. There's one way in particular, which is that I became, I realized that one of the things that forms do, which I was already kind of thinking about, but this really likes, is they transmit affect. So representations, when you look at them, when people represent gender and sexual nonconformity, or they represent queer people or feminists, they don't only tell you information about gays and lesbians and feminists and women and uh, transgender people. They, they transmit or give you a feeling about what it means to be queer or um, gender nonconforming, et cetera. And so it allowed me to make a, a stronger claim for the affective force of forms and their necessity. And this is something I struggle with my students, right? My students often want representations to do something for them specifically. So their favorite, their favorite gambit, right? Like their, their favorite activity in class is to say, well, this movie you made us watch is so homophobic and disgusting and racist and I hate it and all the characters are awful and they don't represent something that, is, that means something to me. And my thing is that may or may not be true and we can debate that, but, they, but so what? Also like representations do many things and they usually don't accurately capture what it is like to live in the real world. Mm -hmm. But what else is this form doing for us? How is it transmitting new ways of feeling? Mm -hmm. And why don't we just keep proliferating forms rather than deciding that we hate some, right? I just think I really believe in the idea of just producing as many as possible, um, which kind of approximates the actual heterogeneity of human beings. And so something <laughs> that was very moving to me about mm -hmm. interviewing people was that people often said, oh, yeah, it's, it was ridiculous that the narrative was almost all white, but like, I just knew that that didn't represent the diversity of San Francisco. And I just, I, I took what from it, what I liked and I ignored what I didn't like. Uh -huh. Or other people said, I never identified with any of the characters. Many gay men wrote, told me, they were like, I hated Michael. He's so annoying. I never identified with him. And the point was that readers have a very sophisticated relationship to the text yeah. that is about the feeling it gave them, not about whether or not it accurately described all of their lives. Right, right, right. Well, this leads to a, a question that has come in from, an, uh, from the audience, which is, let me just read it. Uh, I, I'm wondering about the effects of the serial form on, on Mopin. Did it compel him to learn more about the cultural geography of San Francisco? Did it compel him to learn more about people? The voracious form of the serial, I guess the idea that it needed to be fed constantly uh, with new material, uh, uh, needed to be fed. How, how did that weekly grind yeah. contribute to the ways in which Tales of the City explored the possibilities of San Francisco? Maupin was so inspired by his own everyday encounters with people in lots of different uh, social worlds in San Francisco. So he was in many ways very, very taken. Like this is a, 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 a space of critique of Maupin and the text. He was very taken with the culture of elite patrician San Franciscans. He loved the idea of basically hobnobbing uh, with a lot of like the wealthiest people in the city. But he also lived a life in which he circulated in lots of different worlds, in the Castro on Polk Street. Um, what did somebody, uh, somebody who was a radical activist during the 70s said that there was kind of a split between the sweater gays and then the, uh, the street gays, the idea that there were people, um, and, and people associated Moppet with the, the idea of the sweater gays, right? The, the idea of a kind of a more um, kind of elite group of, uh, of gay people in the city. But he circulated in all those circles. And one thing the sort of serial format made very visible to him was that if he focused on a given character on a particular day, let's say he focused on Dee Dee Halcyon Day, who is kind of one of the, the elite figures in the text, he started hearing that rich people in the city would only read those installments and they would ignore the installments about Marianne and her friends, mm -hmm. right? And so what he decided to do 
was to try to tell stories where all of the characters are being talked about in each installment mm -hmm. or the characters are intersecting. And by doing that, he began to actually describe the surprising and unexpected crossings of these different worlds, right? But I do also believe, and I, I'm happy to talk about this a little bit more later in the Q&A, that there was a limit to what he could narrate. He spoke very much from his experience. The text is very much uh, focused on the lives of white queer people. And he shied away ultimately, imaginatively and creatively of going out, finding out and being able to tell stories about queer people of color. Um, and I think that that's kind of a pitfall of the narrative. And again, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it later just because it's its own can of worms that I would love mm -hmm. to, if someone wants to ask me about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I talk extensively about that in the chapter. Um, and I'll also point out that he wrote many, most of them on the fly. So he wrote most of the stories the day before they were due or the morning they were due. And so he was using so much of his own experience and kind of just like uh, saying, I went to this bar yesterday, let me tell a story about people going to this bar. So it, this, that's why it really, a friend of mine once described it as live tweeting in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And in, in many ways it was. I love the idea that it's a kind of, that over time the serial becomes almost a game between author and readers in which he realizes how they're reading it. So he changes the way he writes it in order to defeat certain ways of reading it. And yeah. before long, they're, they're, yeah. they're responding to each other. One more question about seriality from the audience. Yeah. And then we, we can either move on to other topics or keep going, depending yeah, on- and People are people. welcome to ask about the large yeah. project and other things I write about in sure. it. Okay, so here's a question and I will read it. Good morning from Folsom Street, Ramsey. I'm very intrigued by your conceptualization and articulation of queer formalism, particularly in reference to the serialness uh, of tales. How do you understand the serialness, now this is a little different from what we've been talking about, uh -huh. of, of its reiterations, revisions, regenerations in both the 1993 and 2019 film representations in relation to queer formalism? Okay. And there's one more little clause. Yeah. In relation to queer formalism against and or across generational knowledges. Okay. You know, if you read my broader work, especially my work on comics, something I say over and over and over again, it's kind of become my hobby horse, is that part of the genius of seriality is that it is about endless unfolding. There is something deeply queer about serialness because mm -hmm. it never lands anywhere indefinitely. So serial unfolding is always implying that there is a next thing and a next thing and a next thing. And something I write a lot about in this book and also in my queer writing on comics is that many queer artists, writers, filmmakers, they use this quality of seriality to describe sexuality as something that is endlessly unfolding and that never arrives at an end point, right? And I find that fascinating. And the same thing with all of the adaptations of Tales of the City, they build on this seriality and they keep open and alive the possibility that the characters might be rendered differently every time. So when I was first kind of presenting on this work last year, Netflix had released its new version of Tales of the City, the most updated version, which had come after three major um, PBS and then Showtime series in the 90s. And everybody wanted to know what I think because everybody wanted me to say that I hate it. Right, like that's everybody was like, I, I hated this about it and I hated that about it. And there's a lot to critique, but it's also quite beautiful and moving. It represents a much more multiracial San Francisco in a really authentic, genuine way. It deals with tr issues of transgender experience and embodiment in a very, very beautiful way. And it's lovely to see the old characters because they're so complex and also annoying. Marianne is like a deeply problematic character who is not so easily um, recuperated by the narrative. So what's beautiful is that seriality in that sense, the serial adaptations, they leave open the possibility that more people could be included in this story. Nothing about the original tales of the city forecloses the idea that a multiracial cast, more transgender people, more kinds of people could be part of that universe. It was simply the limit of Maupin's imagination at the moment that he wrote it, that he didn't tell that story, but it never foreclosed that story being told. And that's what the Netflix series does, which I think is really astonishing. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where I think intergenerations, um, to speak to the question of intergenerational knowledge, 
a huge part of my project is I'm trying to get my students to realize they have so much to learn from the movements for women's and gay liberation because they're a font of imaginative possibility and their failures or pitfalls don't need to be a reason to throw away everything that was invented. So my students will look back and say, you know, the women's movement was transphobic. The gay liberation was racist and transphobic, by the way, which is not entirely true and is a much more complex story. And so they discard and throw away the past. And I say, what if you saw those movements as serial in nature? They keep coming back to you now. Now that you're arguing for a transgender revolution, the way in which women thought about destroying gender binaries says a lot to, to this moment, right? The way in which queer people reimagined intimacy and sexuality should say a lot to you now, and it can come back recursively. So Tales of the City is kind of a beautiful model of how one text and all of its limits and problems can return to us anew and we can do something else with it mm -hmm. without throwing it away. Mm -hmm. Very nice, yeah. Um, another question uh, from the audience. Uh, such a great talk, thank you. Can you say more about what you mean by queer reproduction? Do you think the concept can be articulated to feminist discourses around social reproduction and reproductive labor? If so, how? If not, why not? So I borrow that term from uh, the queer theorist Valerie Rohe. She thinks about this in this really fascinating, weird book that not many people have talked about in queer studies called um, uh, Lost Causes, Narrative, Etiology, and Queer Theory. And her central claim in that book is simply that the argument that queer people have made in the last 20 years, that we were born gay and that is why we should be free, has been disastrous for gay politics because it relies on the idea that we must legitimize our existence on the basis of an essential genetic um, um, like predisposition. And she says, what does it matter? Who cares if you're born with it or not? Right, she, she cites Eve Sedgwick, who famously says in, um, in this essay called How to Raise Your Kids Gay, How to Raise Your Kids Up Gay. She says, it doesn't matter whether you're born with it or you're not. In a homophobic society, people want gay people dead no matter what, right? And so Valerie Rohe says, exactly. We should never be arguing that we are not trying to produce more of ourselves or that um, we, we are born this way. We should be saying, Queerness is a social reality that we want to spread everywhere and see what happens, right? So in that sense, I do think that it is un unhooked from the idea of actual reproduction, right? Of women's reproductive capacities, et cetera. I think she's actively saying we should create a form of reproduction that is not about the fact that gay people have children, which they do, um, or that we are reproducing gay culture, right? Judy Garland, Camp, whatever. She says we should talk about queer reproduction as the way in which we circulate queer ways of viewing the world or seeing it outside of heterosexual life trajectories. Um, and so in that sense, you know, when I think about that, the relationship of that to feminism, um, I don't think of it in the terms of social reproduction. I think of it in the ways in which feminists imagined that a feminist worldview, like the moment that you begin to see patriarchy for what it is, like it actually, it turns a light bulb in people's minds. And that, that kind of catches like wildfire, right? This is what lesbian separatists thought in the 1970s, what radical feminists argued. Women of color, like the women who wrote the Kambahi River Collective statement will say, there is this moment when you realize something is wrong and your brain kind of breaks. And you have this moment in which like feminism reproduces itself in your mind in the way that you think about the world and it circulates to the people around you. So I think those are kind of the terms that I think of it, but I think it is a different concept than being re related to the idea of like, of, of actual laboring and, and reproduction. I don't know if that's, a, that's an adequate response to that question. But. Well, let me, let me follow up with a question of my own based on that, because there's another wonderful moment in the talk where you, um, you uh, allude, you sort of allude back to the very first slide, which is the first installment of the of Tales of the City, and yeah. you say, and you, you come out with this notion of self-nomination, self and you yeah. say, 
you say in effect, if I hear you right, and this is what I'd like you to elaborate on. Yeah. You, know, you say in effect that self-nomination is the expanded version of coming out and you imply that Tales of the City is actually, which appears to be so much of it about coming out, is in fact about self-nomination. That it yeah. is a, a, a capacity or a process that's open, as it says yes. in the first installment, that's open to anyone, and that you're sort of renaming something yeah. that is culturally familiar and also temporally specific and putting it in an expanded context. I'd love you to say a little more about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, when I was talking about self-nomination, I was talking specifically about the way Anna Madrigal talks about inventing her own name. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking a little bit here of the book that I cited at the beginning of this, this talk, David Getz's incredible book, which I always recommend to everybody, Abstract Bodies, 60s Sculpture and the Expanded Field of Gender. He does a chapter in that book on Dan Flavin's, he's a very famous uh, light sculpture who uses these kind of neon bulbs and you would never in a million years think that any of his sculptures are about being trans or about gender transitivity. But what Getsy does is he says, every single one of these sculptures is, is usually untitled. And then there's a parenthesis in which a name is ascribed to the sculpture. And one of the arguments he makes that's really counterintuitive is that, that Flavin is thinking about the power of self-naming that is so central to transgender existence. The idea that somebody changes their name as a way to claim a new subjectivity, to live in the world differently. And I think that Tales of the City was so fundamentally about that. Anna Madrigal, um, this character, spends so much time describing how she created herself, right? And what's interesting is that when I interviewed people, the person that most readers identified with, regardless of their gender, sexuality, age, was Madrigal because they wanted to be her, right? They were like, I felt like I was a Marianne when I arrived in San Francisco, but I aspired to become Madrigal. The self right? and in a, character, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. I think that's so fascinating. Yeah. They're aspiring yeah. to become this person who self-creates and creates a yeah. chosen family, yeah. which is central to Tales of the City, right? This is Maupin's idea of the logical family as opposed to your biological family. And I think, that Tales of the City instilled in its readers, the idea that daily, every day, you invent. Every day, you go to that laundromat, you go to that orgy, you go to this restaurant, you go to this bar, and you're different the day after. Yeah. And then you can wake up and read about other people doing the same thing in the paper. Yeah, 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 fantastic. Um, now, I wanna invite you to return to something you mentioned in passing that you, would, you said you would like to talk about, which is the, uh, how to, uh, to frame it in sort of present day terms, the l lack of diversity in the yeah. original story. Uh, and you said you deal with this in your chapter and I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. I think that Tales of the City has a variety of forms of diversity that are very rich. It's very diverse in terms of class. Um, it's very diverse in terms of its gender and sexual arrangements. So like a lot of people have pointed out in the past that um, you know, Maupin famously was told that he could only have a certain number of gay characters, but if you actually look at the narrative, almost everyone ends up being gay except like two characters in some way. Mm. So like there's, there's a lot of same-sex desire, there's a lot of queerness in many different ways. But yes, famously the text uh, very much underrepresents people of color in, um, um, in San Francisco, and it has this fascinating moment, which I do a very deep dive in, um, in my chapter, in which one of the characters, Dorothea, who appears initially as an African-American woman, who is a supermodel, who's made it in the modeling industry, she moves back to San Francisco from New York to be with her lover, who is Mona, who will find out that Mona and her had an on-again, off-again relationship. But something happens near the end of the first year, which is Dorothea, it is discovered that Dorothea is, is not actually Black. She's faking it. And that she's been taking like melanin supplements and she's like a Rachel Dolshell character. Mm -hmm. And this seems like so absurd and so awful. But I find the scene fascinating for this reason. I study how in the process of introducing a black character, because the character was initially supposed to be black. Maupin talks about the idea that he received a letter in the mail from a reader, an African-American woman who said to him, who are you to tell the story of black women the character that you've rendered is so inauthentic, is essentially a white woman in blackface, 
And like, you don't have the author, like the authority to tell the story. So he responds to this by actually making this woman white, right? And fascinated by this entire scenario for these reasons. On the one hand, at the height of radical left-wing identity movements and identity politics in the 70s, an African-American reader is saying to a gay white man, like, you can't speak for black people, which is a, a really compelling legitimate claim. But Maupin could have responded by saying, my job is to tell the stories of lots of different people. So maybe what I should do is go learn more about African-Americans in San Francisco and be able to more authentically tell the story. Instead, what he does is he abdicates responsibility for telling that story. And this is how I read that. By the time of late 1976, he was conceived of as the person who was like the Shakespeare of gay life in, in, in the United States. So suddenly people assumed that he could tell the universal story of gay people, but he knew that he was only telling a little slice of who queer people are. So by saying, I don't have a right to tell the story of black people, he gets to claim that he has the right to tell the story of all gay people, because that's his subject position. And my argument is to say all of these positions are deeply problematic because people should be able to tell stories across identities and no one should claim to universally be able to tell any story. But I think that this was kind of a response to the limits of his own imagination mm -hmm. and the fact that he felt this overwhelming burden to tell a certain kind of gay story and everybody was kind of looking at him and being like, are you gonna do this right? And he kind of says like, why don't I not even open that can of worms, right? Mm -hmm. On the flip side, yeah, no, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, yeah. I will also add, there's a lot of deeply offensive moments throughout the series mm -hmm. in which rich gay people speak in very offensive ways about people of color, particularly as their help, the, po the Puerto Rican pool boy, et cetera. And what I find interesting is that he is essentially documenting the way white rich people talked about people of color. And it's cringeworthy. And so I don't even think that it is what he thinks. He is, he is describing to you what a certain kind of patrician gay elite says whether or not that's accurate or true, like, is another story. I spoke to many readers who said, like, I never heard people say those things in the gay circles that I circulated in, right? But, but I think that that's quite fascinating. Um, let me ask you, a, maybe this is unanswerable and maybe it will come across as sort of a curveball, but I'm curious to know what you yeah. would say about this. Um, you know, a moment ago, I, I mentioned a comparison with Dickens uh, and yeah. the seriality of, you know, fiction, certain kinds of fiction. And in a way, what you're documenting is that you might, one might say, the very last episode in a pre-digital culture mm -hmm. in which that goes from, you know, before Dickens, but up to, yeah. up to Tales of the City, yeah. where, where uh, everybody's reading the same thing. And, yes. and yes. especially in a small city like San Francisco, everybody's reading the same thing it's amazing. As, you, as you amply document, you know, people go get the newspaper, they read it to each other, yeah. it, it conditions their behavior, that tells them which safe way to go to and so on. Then it feeds back into the fiction and it's this kind of closed um, circuit of, of, yeah. of, of, of uh, with literature at the center. Yeah. Could that happen today? And uh, this is the unanswerable part because I don't know what I would say, but, but yeah. from, from your, you're an expert in this kind of thing in a historical moment. Could this happen today? And also, um, here's the really hard one. Uh, you know, what would you say to the, 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 the Ramsey of 20 years from now who is trying to do a project like this? You know, what would you say would be the challenges and what, where, where would you look yeah. if you were trying to document something like this in present day culture? Oh my God, what a great question. You know, I think that this happens today in various formats. So it happens, for instance, in the bestseller. So you think about how like Alison Bechtel's Fun Home went from being like an autobiographical lesbian graphic novel to becoming the most adapted, you know, work of gay comics ever. It was read massively and it became a national bestseller. I think the problem is that in order for something to be shared so widely now, it is, it is either massive, it's like national or global, or it's among a very, very small niche of people. Mm -hmm. I think that middle space uh, in yeah. which you have a text, right, that circulates to a group of people that, um, like a whole city, 
or a community, right? Like San Francisco tries to do that through the City Reads program, where they right. say, we're all gonna read the same book at the same time, right? That's what's missing. So you drop out everything between aficionados and, I, and, yes. and I think the that's entire general public. Exactly. Right. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that's something that drops out. And I think having a material object that people hold in their hands that is circulated between them, this is why I love comics. Because mm -hmm. when Americans were buying comics, they're so cheap and you just hand them off to people. Like it's not, you're not worried that it's going to get lost. You're like, it should right. get lost. I hope that it goes into <laughs> lots of people's hands, right? <laughs> this can be reproduced in the digital realm in different ways. I just, I think like, I agree with Jenny O'Dell, who wrote this brilliant book that we've all talked about at the center, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy. She says, it's not that all of these forms of reading and engagement are not possible online. It is that the major um, interfaces of groups like, uh, of, of websites like Facebook, like um, Twitter, they don't lend themselves to public dialogue. They're about short declarative statements that you make into a void. And you can barely have dialogue and conversation. What it will require for us to ha experience that again is the actual reshaping of those digital interfaces to produce collective dialogue, which is very difficult, right? So it requires invention. Yeah. I would say yeah. that people who work in comics are doing some of yeah. that best work today. Mm -hmm. If I were looking back 20 years from now, you know, I would tell myself what I tell all my students, which is trust your intuition, surprise yourself. Like I'm, I'm basically driven by, I'm going to be, I'm go old school liter literary studies. I'm very driven by Barbara, the, the famous theorist, Barbara Johnson's idea that a strong analysis or a strong reading of a text returns the surprise of otherness. You do a reading of a text that returns to you something that you would never have expected. I'm finding that now when I write about lesbian separatism, this strand of feminism that is essentially now thought of as garbage, like disavowed, you know, essentialist, myopic, white, this idea that you could produce a universal sisterhood among lesbians. And one of the arguments I make is that we actually do a lot of that today. Mm -hmm. Like we actually do a lot of the same thing that lesbian separatists did. We, 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 we hold tight to certain identities that we hope will bind us all together in the face of oppression. We are obsessed with separating from the sources of, our, of violation and harm, which we should be, right? But there's so much more continuity. And in some ways, I wanna to return to, to the reader the surprise of lesbian separatism, that it's actually kind of like everywhere in our thought process but we forget that. And so I read these very unusual movies, Zardoz and Born in Flames, as movies that kind of visualize what separatism could look like. So I would say to myself what I always say, which is simply like, let yourself be surprised by your objects. Run mm -hmm. around and grab, like read something and then read, watch a movie about like the feminist movie and then watch everything it references. Mm -hmm. Read a famous gay liberation political tract and read everything that it's talking about. Just like follow the trail. That's yeah. how I discovered yeah. everything I did, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, and that's the, that's the ethos of the literary critic fundamentally, you know, uh, which is why I admire your work so much. We have three more minutes, yeah. one more quick question from the audience. And, and Can I do one thing before you ask me that? Somebody wanted me to repeat one line from the text and sure. I just want to repeat that line. Please do. So somebody's asked me to repeat the last line, which is a, quote, a, gay, a gay liberation political quote. And the quote says, gay revolution, will produce a world in which all social and sensual relationships will be gay and in which homo and heterosexuality will be incomprehensible terms. And I think this is really extraordinary and powerful because it speaks to the way in which gay liberation was really not interested in identities, in the idea of like, I'm gay and I'm straight and I'm this, right? It was interested in the idea of destabilizing identity so much that essentially all relationships would be gay, right? Which means they could be joyful or happy or whatever you wanted to nominate gay as. And I think that's quite powerful. But I'm sorry, Roland, you were gonna ask me one more the last, question? The last question that just came in, and if you can give us a quick answer to this, it would be good. Yeah. Bridging this new work with your brilliant work on superhero comics, what do you feel realistic fiction can accomplish that fantastical fiction cannot and vice versa? 
So if you read my work on superhero comic books, I don't believe that realism and fantastical literature are opposed. I think they're just on, the, they're all on the, a spectrum. Everything is fantasy. Every story you tell is a fantasy. There is no way that you will ever adequately capture the lived experience of being human and being in this moment in words. So the minute that you do it, it becomes its own thing. You're, you're fantasizing that you think that you're telling a realist story. Um, but I think what realist fiction does a lot, like, like fiction that claims that is realistic, I'm less interested in it, to be honest. Not because it isn't compelling or beautiful or can't be amazing, but because some of it is trying to aspire to describe the world as it is. And just personally as a reader, not even talking as a scholar, I don't really want to know what the world is. I already know it. I'm living it. Like I want a text to give me the world anew in a surprising way. But I do agree that what realist fiction does that's really powerful, and I'm borrowing here from the, the literary theorist Nirvana Tanuki, who writes about this in an essay called The Scale of World Literature, is that when you see something that's realist, when you pick up a text, let's say, and let's say it's about your neighborhood. So um, you pick up Michelle T's book, Valencia, and it's about Valencia, being a lesbian and living on Valencia Street in San Francisco. And let's say you live in the mission. The first thing that you're gonna do, Tanuki says, is you're going to start to scale the distance in your mind between your experience of that neighborhood and the way it's being described. You're gonna be like, is that what Valencia Street is like? And what will happen is that the realist text multiplies the meanings of the place that you are in and that you live. Because it, you, you keep measuring the differences between how that text describes your world and your experiences of it. And then you integrate that text into your experience. So it adds different definitional richness. I think fantasy texts just do that times a million. Mm. Like fantasy texts take that and they explode everything you think you know about the world. Like you thought this was a table, it's a dragon, right? Like you thought that this was, um, you know, a gathering, it's actually like a, a magical convention, whatever. It's like right. people inventing new things in the world. And I, I think that's, I find that really compelling and powerful. I guess that's a good spot to end with because I, I want to thank you for a, a more than an hour that has really uh, captured the joy of intellectual work. Uh, we really are in your debt for this, Ramsey. Thank you so oh, much. It's my for pleasure. Thank here. you all so much. And for and anyone... Yeah, anyone in the audience who wants to continue the conversation with Ramsey, let me uh, invite him to provide his email address. So my email address is Fawaz, my name, so F-A-W-A-Z, at wisc.edu. So it's just like the part of Wisconsin, W-I-S-C dot E-D-U, Fawaz at wisc .edu. And I would be happy to hear what you thought of the talk. If you have questions, I'll try my best to respond and uh, quickly. And uh, it was wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody, please join us next time, which is August 26th for the next uh, installment of the Inside the Center series with the, uh, someone well known to Ramsey, the historian and political commentator, uh, Geraldo Cadava, Jerry Cadava. Uh, Jerry will discuss his latest book, The Hispanic Republican, The Shaping of an American Political Identity from Nixon to Trump. Again, that's August 26th. And please visit our website, shc.stanford.edu for more event updates. Thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you again.